Uh, a new film is releasing in cinemas on the 7th of March, starring Michael Caine and Glenda Jackson. It's a film called The Great Escaper. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of The Great Escaper, Oliver Parker. Oliver, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Ah, well, thank you for having me. It's your evening, isn't it? It's my early morning, so we'll try and make our times meet. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Now, this is based on a true, the film is based on a true story set in 2014 of a, a man who escaped his care home, attended the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings in France. Such an interesting story. How did it come about that it has been turned into a film? Well, it took a while. I wasn't at the very inception of it. The Pathé, the film company over here, they they developed it as well as another company called Ecos. And they read about it. I remember the event. It had a, there's quite a little puff of publicity over one weekend in, well, now 10 years ago, it was 2014. And um, and it was one of those ones where a lot of people said at the time, oh, this will make a great movie. And you thought, yeah, yeah, could do. And and then finally a script winds its way towards my desk. And I must admit, I was a little apprehensive about it because I did think it's the kind of British slightly cheesy feel good project that that could be a bit irritating and um uh and yet billy ivory who'd done the script um and he's a wonderful writer and um he'd made maiden dagenham for example mm. years ago and um has a real kind of voice particularly of working class characters but he also it, we discovered had a real root into the story which coincided with mine in as much as, as you'll know, it's very much about PTSD, really. And, and Billy had a father who was in the RAF and um, and was severely traumatised and so never spoke about it until almost the end of his life, which coincided with working on this film for Billy. And my father had also been in the army and and never really wanted to talk about it. And when I asked him about it, he was... He was a very, very kind of open-minded and balanced individual, but there were just areas you just knew you didn't go into. And that generation, in a way, they just sucked it up. And um, and I was just conscious of the power of this kind of repressed emotions. And I felt like Billy's script was onto something there. So it almost did the opposite of what I feared the script might do in terms of making it kind of too obvious and celebrating um as it were, the whole event, much more looking at, if you like, a battle fought on two fronts. One being dealing with the demons of his past and his sense of complicity in the war machine, and the other being old age and how it is kind of condescended to and what the story is in the media, really, and 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 what it's really like to live under those conditions. And as he says in the script, you know, no one survives. Even if you actually survive the war, you're not unscathed. So uh, there was the meeting of those two themes, which I thought he did beautifully in the script. And we worked together on it for a while, but he'd always had the essence of it. And uh, and then we got to a place where it was all about casting. And uh, we took it from there. Ah, what a fascinating backstory to uh, creating this film. That's uh, that is so interesting. Yes, let's talk about casting because working with two greats, uh, Michael Caine and Glenda Jackson, um, uh, both uh, what in their night or almost in their nineties, whatever, when you made the film, that must have been quite a, an interesting experience for you. Well, it was fascinating, and also again, it was one of those things where they were our absolute dream cast. And you don't often get your dream cast, even if they wanted to. You know, there's so many logistics about getting a, a project and the performers in the same place at the same time. Mm. Uh, but Michael, we nearly made it about three years ago, two, three years ago. Um, but Michael had to have an operation. And, and at that time, he thought it might have been the end of his career. And it was COVID time as well. And so a lot of Actually, quite a lot of actors were thinking, is that my last shot, you know? And so I went away and did something else. And then things, he recovered a bit. And Glenda, who we'd been in touch with, stayed true to it. Um, uh, and uh, and so 
there was something about I think everybody was kind of invested in it. There was something about this project where I felt you were carrying precious cargo, you know, and um, and it, I think the 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 emotions in it were deceptively powerful, you know, in that it's lighthearted in certain ways and breezy, and he's and the character is so like Michael, you know. So when it was come coming to casting, yes, there are obviously a few great actors of similar age. But there he was, an ex-soldier. There he was with this mischievous kind of uh, wit and um, at the same time, powerful emotions, which he plays with so lightly. Um, so he was kind of such a great option. And I was just delighted that he responded to it. I think he it really was the character that, that brought him back into another performance. You know, he was like, how could you resist that? Um, and then Glenda... Again, there's something about, you know, I've always been a fan of hers and it was astonishing how when she came back into acting after something like 22 years, you know, and wasn't really thinking of pursuing acting again, but people badgered her into it. And not long <laughs> after she's playing King Lear on the national stage, playing the title role, you know, and... Uh, and I got to meet her and it was one of those things where you're slightly nervous of meeting someone who is kind of iconic in your mind and it's so easy to be disappointed by that but was in no way she just had this astonishing charisma based on absolute conviction you know she's it's, uh, it was, it's kind of sh rather shocking that she died so soon after the film because mm -hmm. during the making of it she was so robust she had this kind of fire in her and it was blazing. I mean, it's a funny little creature by then, because having been almost Amazonian at various points in her career, mm. to meet her, and she definitely was, you know, a, a smaller specimen, gaps in her teeth and cataract eyes, and and does nothing to her looks. She wasn't interested in that, no vanity at all. And yet connected to the things she cared about, and you had this blazing uh, intensity. And... And wow, so it was very, very exciting to find somebody who, again, so connected to the character, because I called, I remember the first time, I, the first time I met her was on the phone, and and we sent the script, <laughs> and I said, so how, how do you find it? Well, first of all, I said, how are you? And she said, well, the, the bloody hip's terrible. <laughs> she didn't know I was, I've been trying to get this hip big for bloody months, and what's happened to the NHS? I get a bit of this for a while. I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a good conversation. And then I say, what about... Um, what about the character? Well, you know, I mean, it's good, but he, it, the, on page five here, it says she slouches on the sofa. She would never slouch. You know, I know these women. She was a ballroom dancer. It's all about how they appear. And, they, and this would not happen. <laughs> I just loved it. She completely owned the character from the moment she read it. And it was actually very interesting afterwards because I met her, all her family at the British premiere after she died. And they said how much like her the character was, much more than anything they'd seen her do. And it was partly because partly because our editor adored her and her performance that he would rescue these little bits, little sounds and little kind of eccentricities that she had as a person. And we kind of built them into the character a bit, uh, or rather just rescued them. She'd built them already. And uh, so it was a, it, it was just so deeply personal to her. You know, that's what that's what I think gives her this intensity. Is she she doesn't make any distinction between the character and herself, and it's not like she's being method or anything. You know, between every take, she's going out having a fag and a coffee on the balcony, and then she's back in again, and uh, and and again blazing both barrels. And uh, and to, to have the two of them together was just delicious, really, because. They had a lot of respect for each other. He was a little nervous, you know, that she might think he's an old fascist, is what he said, because they're quite different politically. And of course he isn't, yeah. but you're nervous of her. You know, she's uncompromising. And and But they were really wonderful together. And uh, it just made the whole thing... It, it was kind of fascinating. There's a story I, I, I love to tell about her, actually, on the first week, where, for various reasons, it was a fast shoot, 30 days, and um, 
for schedule reasons, we had to put a lot of her material together. So in the first 10 days, she did nearly all her work. And it was big scene after big scene, lots of dialogue, word perfect every time. We got to the end of the first week and a lot of the crew had never even heard of her. You know, it's quite interesting this because she hasn't been around to their eyes and um, don't know there's two Oscars in the past or the incredible performances she's given. They know mm -hmm. nothing. And they just see this funny little old woman coming on set and blowing them away. And so we got to this bit at the end of the that first week where I'm calling cut on the last shot. And the young crew, mainly, some of them are literally a quarter of her age, just burst into applause. And she looks up, kind of slightly gnarly looks, and goes, I oh, don't be so fucking patronising. <laughs> she goes like that. <laughs> and I said, they're not patronising. It's just awesome. Oh, oh, sorry, darling. Sorry. But, <laughs> but it was just so typical of her. Yes, what a, what a wonderful story! And uh, as you've described, they work so well together. It's it's uh, it's just that beautiful on screen chemistry that uh, that works so well. And uh, and it was really nice to see uh, John Standing uh, also uh, in the film. Yeah, wonderful performer. I mean, funnily enough, in the casting, uh, he was another one who, when we were thinking who could it be, and again there was a quite uh, renowned names who were in the offing. But I remember seeing him. In actually a very slight production, not to do it down, it was meant to be. It was a Noel Coward production of Hay Fever years ago. And and I remember the ability he had to be elegant and moving in by quick succession, you know. And um uh, and I got to know him. And of course he is virtually Michael's age, you know, he's 89 now, and um and had this wonderful energy, and they are good friends. So the whole thing fitted so nicely, and mm. and my and he actually, John was was a little nervous because he'd learned everything on that first first go round when we nearly made it. He'd learned every line, and then he was obviously so disappointed. But he says, "I'm you know I'm rooting for you to come back." And we came back. He said, "I hope you haven't changed any of the words <laughs> because they're cemented in my brain." Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, and sure enough, he had them there and they, he, you know, he makes it look so effortless, but actually mm. the work he puts it in, puts into it is astonishing. And the kind of the real kind of craft he has as an actor. So their scenes together were were lovely as well. That relationship is a is a very deep and poignant one. Mm. It certainly is. And uh, I love the title, The Great Escaper, which, yes. which of course, has a relationship to The Great Escape. And, yes. and there is that issue, too, of, of the uh, the Germans who uh, he encounters in the film. And mm. I found that was so interesting, that interplay between them. Mm. Yes, it was. Well, of course, the title comes from that policeman who sent it out as a hashtag when the real event happened. And Billy leapt on that. And... Um, uh, yeah, I think um, the whole connection with the Germans, again, was one of the most powerful elements of the script, certainly when I read it, because um, it was like, how is he going to address this? You know, they all turn up together at the same event. And, and again, there's a sort of simplicity about Michael's approach to work. And I, I don't mean simplified. I mean, just the directness of it. Mm -hmm. And we had the scene, and Billy had written it beautifully, but he'd written it a bit. You know, there was there was quite a lot. And Mike was saying, I don't think I need to say this, you know. I think I can mean this. I think I can look at my eyes, and he would do it, and you would get it. And it was so it was this wonderful process of paring down, you know, to get something, hopefully, of an essence for what the whole story is kind of about, you know, mm -hmm. in... in uh, although it's beautifully written, th with al almost any dialogue at the centre of the story is this encounter. And for him really to come to terms with so many of the these buried kind of fears and prejudices and an old man who's determined to change. You know, that's the thing that I I, I think that makes it so powerful is is this desire in somebody who's clearly not got long to go to do another real return to the battle scene. And, and that was another, if you like, stepping back onto the battlefield. And I think there was, 
there was something in that even for and for the um for the german actor too you know who you probably would i don't know if you recognize him but he'd been that german in those films uh <laughs> and uh yeah he's Eagle has landed and Spielberg and he's a that incredible jaw and you know wonderful character and it was very moving uh a day for us to have that happen and sometimes you just know it when you're shooting it you just you can feel it usually goosebumps I find but but there's something's happening you, you hope you've caught it in the camera but they made it happen you know they certainly did it really worked well for, uh, certainly for me when I was watching the film um okay. I, I I noticed too the film was largely shot in England because, of course, traveling yeah. to France and so on would have been problematic and probably difficult and expensive. So um, I think you uh, you did that very well. It was a little bit of a challenge, I must admit. When we were first starting out, I thought we've got to find a way. You know, Bernie at 89 finds a way to France. <laughs> Surely we can get close to it. But it did prove. And, you know, it's so difficult raising money in um, the sort of uh, the British indie world now. Um, and it was like, how much of our resources would we lose? Even when you've got stars like that, you know, it's just, you'll know, but it's just ridiculous how you have to scale everything down. But we did have a superb designer and he and I went over to Wiesraham in Normandy and we spent some time looking at different ways of trying to evoke it. And uh, at first I thought, mm, I, I'm not sure we can do it. And then we you know, went to Bayer where the, the, the cemetery is. Um, and I thought, well, that surely we've got to pay homage to that. You know, that is mm -hmm. a real cemetery. And, and I come back and actually <laughs> I'm going to the production. No, I think you've got to find a way of coughing up for this. And, and, and but then the location man, him, comes and says, have a look at this. And of course, there's this incredible Commonwealth grave built on an almost similar template in near Woking, outside London. <laughs> oh God, okay. So began to realize, oh, we had quite a lot of the pieces to put together. And, um, and it was kind of fascinating, that thing of just going to a beach the other side of the channel and then coming back to ours and thinking, which way around are we? And how do you make this feel have the same kind of essence. Um, and interestingly, the beaches that where Sword Beach is didn't have as much room even to shoot. Um, so to, though we had some opportunities in the UK to really find something. And that was a special night, you know, because Michael at this point could hardly walk at all. So that's why we came up with the walker idea that he pushes it everywhere. And it's a crutch as much as anything. Um, and but there were times we said we've got to find some places where you can walk, you know, it'd be so great to see that. And he was he was so bold about it. And it was like, well, it doesn't matter if I fall on the sand, <laughs> you know. So he's, so we've got sort of four powerful ADs behind the camera ready to leap out <laughs> and catch this fabulous old character. But he goes striding out and, you know, you've got half an hour to shoot it as the light's going down. And he's going, come on, come on, let's go. So it was a fabulous kind of um, collaboration between us all to try and capture these things which felt somehow spoke to the essence of what Billy had created. Look, congratulations on the film, Oliver. And I know you've directed uh, a number of other films. Uh, I, I know you've uh, done importance of being earnest and... Uh, Dad's Army, Ideal Husband, and so many films. I'm I'm always so intrigued as to how directors choose what uh, films they decide to make, and uh, you've really made a, an interesting selection of films. It's rather surreal. I don't quite know how it's happened. I think I was an actor for quite a few years before I started directing, and I think I sometimes see a film a bit like a part, like I'd like to go into that world and see if how I, if I'll sink or swim, <laughs> and I don't always get it right. But there is a sense of adventure about it. Um, and I, I suppose having worked through that and, and working with writers quite a lot, done some writing myself, I've always kind of wanted to find the best way of of taking those stories to an audience. And it doesn't always mean... So in other words, I don't feel I have a style. I have a, a, a an interest in something. And I then try and think, how, to, how can I tell that? And... Uh, so it's sort it's a it makes it forever a journey of discovering and trying to get better literally it's an it's a, a wonderful job directing in terms of there's just always so much to learn 
you know, so I could spring from one thing going, oh, yeah, how can I take that to something else? And, and then I've forgotten something I thought I had learned. But it means you're always in the mill and always. And so I love I love not not pigeonholing myself. Funny enough, I slightly have pigeonholed myself, I realized, because a lot of the recent ones had been comedies, partly because other projects I was trying to make just didn't happen for various mm. usually funding reasons. And so this would be, a, you know, like Dad's Army. I was trying to make this very big war movie and and it didn't happen for certain reasons dad's army comes up as a sweet comical alternative you know but it's like mm, yeah and, and suddenly rise oh that's how you're being seen so it was lovely to get back into some some sheer drama although there's lovely comedy in it as well the heart of it has real power and uh for me it was a thrill to have the story to tell Look, congratulations on The Great Escaper, uh, releasing in Australian cinemas on March the 7th, and we've been speaking to the director, Oliver Parker. Oliver, thank you so much for talking with me. Well, lovely to chat with you. Take care, Peter. Okay, bye-bye.